Um, welcome to the second part of the video on the, in the scientific writing course on the changing of the paper and then the publishing process including reviews. And in the first part I just covered uh, the difference of a paper to a master's thesis, then the timeline that you would need for making your thesis to a paper and then internal revisions with co-authors and the journal choice. So in this video, I will concentrate on the submission process, then the peer review, and in the end, the typesetting and um, proofreading. So um, first you need to prepare your final files that you submit. That's always a good idea to already do it before, not when you are about to submit, is to use the journal's template. They will usually have templates for both LaTeX and Microsoft Word. So choose whatever you like and already work in this template so you see how it looks like, how long the paper will look like and also for example the width of the figures and um, these kind of things will all be included in the template. Of course there are specifications on how to format your references, how to format your tables and everything. So there are usually quite long guidelines on how to do everything and of course you need to follow that. Then one additional word on the figures. First of all, the number of figures, um, you hopefully read up the journal's guidelines, how many figures you are allowed. And if sometimes still, I think color figures cost, but of course color figures are so much nicer. So you need to discuss this with your supervisor. Then have your figures, of course, uh, very clear and concise and big enough fonts because journals might have two columns and scale your figure to just one of them. Or even if it's a one column journal, figures are usually not the whole width of the PDF page, but just uh, narrower. So make sure you check out uh, how big your figure will actually be and then adjust your font size also in a way that it's the same for all figures, no matter if it's in one or two columns. Of course, uh, all the other advices that I showed in the videos on figures also apply. So please make a consistent design and everything that I mentioned before. And then it's always good to arrange multiple figures in a single display because you're limited with the number of figures. But if one figure is four panels, you can show much more information. And these figure, um, figures usually need to be uploaded separately in addition to the rest of the paper. So make sure you have um, PDFs ready for every figure and check their file size because sometimes there are limitations of how big of a single file is allowed to be. So then you go to the journal's web page, you create an account, you do the submission and be prepared to fill in a lot of information again. So you think it's all in the paper, but they want it separately again. So for example, the title, a short title, the names and affiliations and contact information of all sources. Then you need um, keywords. They ask for highlights most often. And then sometimes there are other things like graphical abstracts or so. Of course, you find out all this information before if you check out the author's guidelines. So please don't be shocked when they all of a sudden ask for highlights and you don't know highlights for your paper. So better prepare that before. But usually you can also save what you did and then go back and work on how to formulate your highlights and then go back to the web page and continue with the submission. Then usually there are other formalities. For example, you always need to have a copyright statement that all the material that you're publishing, that you're allowed to publish it. That's something, of course, you need to clarify before, especially if you use other people's fi figures or parts of other people's published figures. You need to go to the journal and um, ask for contents to publish it again. So make sure that you know um, for every foreign material if you're allowed to publish it. Then often you need to suggest reviewers and those are people in your field but no people that you've recently worked with like no former students of your supervisor and no other close colleagues. So just ask your supervisor and he or she will know a lot of people in the field who the they may be met at one conference and know they are nice, but they don't really work together. And that whole process 
takes at least one hour, but probably it takes much longer. It's usually annoying um, because you think you have everything ready and then they ask for yet another thing. But yeah, you can't help it. Just make sure that if you have a deadline, for example, there's a special issue that you want to submit to and this closes at one point, take enough time for this step. This paper that you submitted goes to the editor. And the editor will decide whether or not this paper goes to review. And this is the first hurdle and please don't underestimate it, especially if you try to publish in a very well-known journal. A lot of papers are directly rejected at this step, not even going to review. And that really doesn't mean that your work is uh, of bad quality or your paper. It only means that the editor thinks it doesn't really fit the journal. Don't worry, just submit another journal. This is really something that happens quite often, so don't get desperate because of this. Then if the editor says, okay, it's a good, probably good, let's send it for a review, you wait. And that's at least six weeks, but probably longer because all potential reviewers are busy and they need time to work on your manuscript. But at one point, the editor gets back the revisions. And then the editor decides whether or not the paper is accepted, accepted with minor revisions, it got major revisions, or is directly rejected at this point. Don't ever hope for accepted, even minor revisions is very unlikely. Usually you get major revisions, hopefully not rejected. So this means that with major revisions you um, answer to all comments, you change your manuscript, and then the editor sends it to the reviewers again. So this is a part of major revision that the reviewers see what you changed and then give their opinion if this is enough, if you need to change more, again to the editor. Minor revisions would mean that um, the reviewers don't see your paper again, but you need to change some things that they suggested, but then the editor decides on his or her own um, whether or not this is enough and then directly publishes it. So this is much faster, but very rare. Usually you get major revisions. Some journals have an open discussion phase like Biology Sciences and I will show you some examples from this journal because that's where I last published my paper. And an open discussion phase means that your original version all reviewers' comments, your answer to the reviewers and your uh, final version are all published. I really like this because um, first of all your original version is already published so people can read it and cite it before you ran through the review process. And I also have the impression that once this original version is published it's less likely to be rejected at this point. It's really more likely that you get an additional round of feedback maybe, but if you really try, your paper will be published in the end. So I think open discussion journals are a good idea. These are, for example, the all the journals of the European Geo Geophysical Union, EGU. And I show you some examples uh, later from my paper and the revisions, how I handled reviewers' comments, just as an example. But first of all, if you get back reviewers comments, what do you need to do? You prepare three documents. One is the answer to all the comments that you get. Then the second is a check change version. So the original version and all the new things that you added or removed in color or crossed out or something. And then uh, you send the new version also, you prepare it. If you do a track change version with LaTeX, just use a package LaTeX diff, it's very convenient. You just need to prepare the new version and it automatically calculates the difference and makes a new nice track change version. Once you prepared all these documents and send them to the editor or publish them on this in this open discussion phase, the decision goes back to the editor and he decides again whether or not to send your comments back to the reviewers. So this in theory would already be said before with the minor revisions or major revisions, but in my case I was really lucky. It was first he said major revisions, but later on I, it was not sent again to the reviewers because the editor was so happy with my answers. So that can also happen. The editor again has to decide or maybe reject it also at this phase if uh, he or she really thinks that you 
didn't answer to any of the comments and it really didn't improve the quality of the paper, this could also be a rejection at this place. So the peer review process. One thing, always be respectful for the reviewers because they spend a lot of time on your manuscript to improve it, to make sure the science is sound, often really also to improve the language like they highlight uh, sentences that are not clear or even spelling mistakes. So they spend time and they are experienced in their field. So just make sure that you always acknowledge this, although maybe you don't like their comments. So it can be very annoying to get review comments if you really didn't ask for these comments, <laughs> but still uh, please be respectful. And one thing that uh, colleague of mine just recently highlighted to me is that she complained that she reviews papers and then she's always addressed as he, like we thank the reviewer the, and he, we acknowledge that he got good points and, and she was really annoyed about it so please don't assume that reviewers are all male. So what you do in your answers uh, to the comments is first you describe how you did your changes and you summarize major changes that you did at the beginning because also the reviewers likely you get several, most often two or three reviewers and they don't necessarily know what the other reviewer said. So you might want to highlight bigger changes to all reviewers even though they didn't ask for it but another one did. Um, so this is one of the examples of a header um, just explaining what the line numbers refer to for example from this paper that I published. Speaking about line numbers it's always good to provide line numbers so the reviewer can really easily go back to the track change version for example and see what you changed in your paper. And then of course you write a detailed answer to more uh, general comments. If it's really just a typo, um, just change it and write the line and that's it. But of course um, you're free to include for example new references or even a figure to show uh, a specific point that the reviewer asked for. So this answer document can really be quite extensive. For example, here somebody wrote this argument is hard to follow and then I wrote back like yeah that we changed all this and they added more references and this kind of things what the reviewer might want to hear. And you need to answer to all comments even if you think oh no this reviewer just didn't understand my point, he didn't read it well, it was all clear. Yeah, could be but you still need to answer to all the points and explain it again because usually if the reviewer didn't understand it, it was just not clear enough. So this is one example for me where I really wondered why does they think I smoothed the data, I didn't do anything, so I explained it again. And this is also an example where I have like a kind of short comment that the section was too short and not well supported and I was a bit unhappy because he, wrote, he or she wrote that there are citations there are many but doesn't suggest any and obviously I looked for literature before and I didn't find anything but well I had to go back check again and I actually found some papers really old ones for example who looked at some of this and I rewrote the complete section so what you see here in blue is what I um, added so basically added a lot of details to make this reviewer happy and have more information on this process in autumn. Then if you are done with the revisions and finally the paper is accepted, there will still be the typesetting process. So that is where the journal adjusts all the formatting again to their specific requirements. Some journals, which is very nice, do some language editing. So they make sure that uh, not only that you don't have typos, but also that it's consistent, for example, British or American English and um, follows all the conventions that they have. So that's two examples here, what they change. For example, they prefer that midday is one word and not separated. And here I, op I apparently got the um, plural wrong. So they change some minor things, but you definitely need to check it 
because things can get wrong and at one point they changed something that the reviewer explicitly asked for so I had to go back and write them and say well please don't change this it's supposed to be this way so definitely make sure you look at the details. Also sometimes you find that the end of your manuscript some questions or they ask for you to confirm that it's still okay so you go to the manuscript and see oh they changed these numbers now they are bold and I had them gray I don't care they can be bold but I had to tell them yeah it's okay that you made it bold instead of gray and there are some other things for example they uh, some of the literature they wanted last access date or other papers where I wrote that they are still in review. They asked like, is this paper already published? So I had to change my references. So I was really happy that they looked at this in so much detail, like check out your references. That's something that you should usually, of course, do on your own. And then another thing again about figures, they get scaled. So this figure I intended for two columns and they scaled it to one. And as you see, the fonts are tiny, barely readable. So I had to go back, um, change my original figure. I put the scale somewhere here so I would be able to make it at least a little bit wider and make the fonts bigger. So really go back and look at all your figures to make sure that they are in the way that you wanted them to be. And there I have the last example here which is from one of my first papers when I was a PhD student. The problem was that I had it almost published and then I went for field work and my supervisor had to do the typesetting proofreading process. And apparently she didn't notice or didn't care that they put these like huge boxes around the ABCD and they change this writing, like this is a serif font which I use and then they have like a completely different font here for the label. And yeah, I came back and I really didn't like it <laughs> for me, like it was uh, messed up with these huge boxes here. I, yeah, can't help it, it's published, so this will be there uh, for ages. Well, it doesn't matter too much also, but still this is something that you need to pay attention to in the typesetting process, like are the figures still in the way that you prepared them and which you like. And sometimes it can really get wrong. So for example, I had a case not in my paper, but in a different paper I heard that like they mixed collops in a table or something. So it was really getting wrong. You need to check, double check everything that they do. But if you do it, that's done. First paper published. Um, I hope you make it. It's a um, nice experience. And also, of course, very helpful if you want to stay in science or um, do a PhD after your studies. Also, otherwise, it might be good to show um, that you've been successful in what you, you're doing um, at university. Okay, so this is the end of my part. Julia will cover um, more the editorial um, point of view, not the author's view, in another video. Thanks for watching.